Picture this, a wooden house built in 1873. No power tools, no pressure-treated lumber, no modern preservatives. Standing in the scorching Nevada desert, enduring over 150 winters, battered by sandstorms and flash floods. And it's still there, solid, beautiful, functional. Now picture your brand new deck, built last year with pressure-treated wood, guaranteed for decades by the lumber yard. And it's already showing rot, black spots, soft wood. The boards are warping. In some places, you can push your finger straight through. What? What in the actual hell is going on? Here's the thing that'll blow your mind. Those Wild West pioneers knew something about wood that we've completely forgotten. Something so valuable that modern lumber companies would lose billions if you understood it. And today, I'm going to reveal exactly what they knew, why it worked, and how the wood industry pulled off one of the greatest scams in construction history. But first, let me tell you about a house that changed everything I thought I knew about wood. Three years ago, I visited a ghost town in Montana, middle of nowhere. Population? Zero. But standing there, perfect as the day it was built, was a saloon from 1881. The wooden siding? Flawless. The floor joists? Solid as steel. The window frames? Not even a crack. 140 years old, and I could have moved in that afternoon. The kicker? The contractor who built my house seven years ago just called. The rim joists are rotting. The deck is failing. The siding needs replacing. Seven years versus 140 years. Modern treated lumber versus primitive techniques. That's when I went down the rabbit hole. And what I found? will fundamentally change how you think about wood, construction, and why everything you own seems designed to fall apart. Let's start with the uncomfortable truth. Your wood is rotting because it's supposed to. I know that sounds like conspiracy theory nonsense, but stay with me. In the early 1900s, lumber companies faced a massive problem. They'd harvested most of the old growth forests. Those massive, slow-growing trees that pioneers used? Gone. Hundreds of years old, dense as iron, practically indestructible, chopped down. What was left? Young trees, fast-growing trees, trees that would be ready for harvest in 20 to 30 years instead of 200. There was just one tiny problem. This wood was garbage. Young wood is weak. It's full of moisture. It rots fast. It warps. It twists. It's everything you don't want in construction lumber. But here's what the lumber industry figured out. If they could treat this inferior wood with chemicals, they could sell it anyway. Better yet, when it failed in a decade or two, you'd have to buy more. Brilliant business model. Terrible for you. Now let's talk about what those Wild West builders actually did, because this is where it gets absolutely fascinating. First, they understood wood in a way we've completely lost. See, a pioneer builder didn't just walk into Home Depot and grab whatever was on sale. They knew trees. They knew that where a tree grew determined everything about how that wood would perform. Trees growing on north-facing slopes, denser, stronger, more rot-resistant. Trees from rocky soil, slower growth, tighter grain, better wood. Trees from river bottom, fast growth, loose grain, rot city. They could look at a forest and know which trees would still be standing in a century and which would fail in a decade. But here's the secret weapon. They cut trees in winter. Sounds simple, right? But this changes everything. In winter, trees are dormant. The sap isn't flowing. The moisture content drops dramatically. When you mill that wood, you're starting with timber that's already halfway to being properly seasoned. Modern lumber? Harvested year-round, whenever it's profitable, often in spring and summer when trees are pumped full of moisture. Then then comes the drying process, and this is where pioneers were absolute masters. They didn't just stack wood in a kiln and blast it with heat for 48 hours like modern mills do. They air-dried lumber for one to three years, sometimes longer. They stacked it with spacers in covered but open-sided sheds, letting air circulate naturally. The wood dried slowly, gradually, allowing the cell structure to adjust without cracking or warping. This slow drying did something incredible. It fundamentally changed the wood at a molecular level. The cell walls collapsed in a controlled way, the wood became denser, stronger, and here's the key, far more resistant to moisture absorption later. Think of it like this. Modern key line dried wood is like flash freezing food. Quick, efficient, but the cell structure gets damaged. Air dried wood, that's like slow curing a ham. Time and patience create something fundamentally superior. But we're just getting started because Wild West builders had another trick that modern construction has completely abandoned. They understood seasoning. After air drying, they'd let lumber sit. Just sit it, sometimes for another year, exposed to the elements but protected from direct rain. This weathering process created a hard outer layer on the wood. Think of it like a natural sealant. The surface oxidized, tightened, became incredibly resistant to moisture penetration. You can still see this on old barns. That silver gray patina? That's not decay. That's a protective layer that gets harder and more water resistant over time. It's doing the job of modern sealants, but it'll last centuries instead of years. Now here's where it gets really interesting. 
interesting. Wood selection. Pioneers didn't use just any wood, they were incredibly selective. For siding and exterior work, they preferred old-growth pine, cedar, redwood, or cypress. Why? These trees produce natural compounds called extractives, tannins, oils, resins. These compounds are natural preservatives that make the wood toxic to the organisms that cause rot. Old-growth trees, because they grew so slowly, concentrated these compounds. The wood was so saturated with natural preservatives that fungi, bacteria, and insects couldn't survive in it. It was basically self-treating lumber. Your modern pressure-treated wood? They're trying to accomplish with harsh chemicals what nature did automatically in old-growth timber. Except nature did it better, and it lasted longer. Let me give you a specific example that proves this point. There's a guy in Oregon who does wood decay research. He took samples from an 1860s barn and compared them to modern treated lumber. He buried both samples in soil, exposed them to moisture, created the perfect conditions for rot. After two years, the modern treated lumber showed significant decay. The old growth sample? Barely any change. The natural preservatives in that old wood were still working after 160 years. But there's another factor that nobody talks about. Density. Old growth wood might have 200 growth rings per foot. Your modern 2x4? Maybe 20 rings in the same space. That means old growth wood was literally 10 times denser. Water can't easily penetrate dense wood. Fungi can't establish. The tight grain acts as a natural barrier. I examined a floorboard from an 1860s ranch house. Under a microscope, the growth rings were so tight I needed magnification to count them. Then I looked at a modern board from Home Depot. The difference was staggering. The modern wood looked like a sponge by comparison. No wonder it soaks up water and rots. Here's something that'll blow your mind. I did a simple water test. Took a piece of reclaimed old growth pine and a modern pine board. Same size. Submerged both in water for 24 hours. The modern board gained 37% in weight. It sucked up water like a paper towel. The old growth? 4% weight gain. That dense grain structure simply wouldn't let water penetrate. That's the difference between wood that lasts centuries and wood that fails in years. Now let's talk about cutting techniques. Because this is where pioneers were absolutely genius. They cut boards radially or quarter sawn. What does that mean? Instead of cutting straight through a log, they'd split it radially from the center, following the growth rings. This is critical. Quarter sawn lumber doesn't warp, it doesn't cup, it doesn't twist, and most importantly, water can't travel along the grain into the wood. Modern lumber? Almost entirely flat sawn because it's faster and produces more boards per log, but flat sawn wood warps, cups, and acts like a straw for moisture. Every board is a pathway for water to penetrate deep into the structure. The cost difference? Quarter sawn lumber takes more time and produces less usable wood per log. It's more expensive, so the lumber industry abandoned it. Your wood rots faster, you buy more wood, they make more money. See the pattern? But here's something even more interesting about how pioneers worked with lumber. They understood something called reaction wood. When a tree grows on a slope or in wind, it develops stressed wood that's incredibly unstable. This wood will warp and twist no matter what you do with it. Pioneer builders could identify reaction wood just by looking at it and they'd reject it entirely. Modern mills? They process everything. That warped board you bought? Probably reaction wood that any old-timer would have used for firewood. But we need to talk about something even more fundamental. Building techniques. Wild West builders design structures to shed water. Every joint, every overlap, every design choice considered one question. How does water move? They built with gravity, not against it. Look at old Western buildings. Wide overhangs, protecting walls from rain. Windows and doors designed to let water flow away from the structure. Foundations that kept wood off the ground. Ventilation everywhere. They didn't try to seal buildings tight. They designed them to breathe. And here's a crucial detail. They used something called a drip edge on absolutely everything. Any horizontal surface had a small groove cut into the underside about an inch back from the edge. When water ran along the bottom of a board, it would hit that groove and drip off instead of wicking back toward the structure. This one simple detail, which takes seconds to add, prevents 90% of water-related wood rot. Modern construction? We've completely forgotten this technique. I visited a mining town in Colorado, where every building from the 1870s still has perfect siding. Know what they all have in common? Drip edges, six-inch overhangs, ventilation gaps. The builders didn't have fancy materials, but they understood water physics better than modern architects with computer modeling software. Modern
modern construction, we seal everything. Vapor barriers, house wrap, caulk everywhere. We trap moisture inside walls and then act surprised when wood rots. We build decks flat against houses, creating perfect rot pockets. We put wood directly on concrete, wicking moisture up from the ground. Pioneer builders would look at modern construction and think we're insane, and they'd be right. Here's a specific example that'll make this crystal clear. Siding. Old Western siding was installed with a technique called board and batten, or with wide overlapping planks. Each board acted independently. Air could flow behind it. Water could drain. If one board failed, you replaced that board. The rest of the structure? Fine. They also beveled the top edge of each board and overlapped them like scales on a fish. Water couldn't flow up into the joint. It could only flow down and off. Simple physics. Unbeatable performance. Modern siding? Often it's sheets of OSB or plywood covered with a thin veneer. One small leak anywhere, and the entire sheet soaks up water like a sponge. Then the whole section needs replacing. It's designed to fail catastrophically instead of gracefully. And don't even get me started on modern composite decking. Sure, it won't rot, but the wooden frame underneath? That's still regular lumber, and it's trapped in a sealed environment with zero ventilation. I've seen composite decks that look perfect on top, but the entire substructure is rotted out underneath. At least with a full wood deck, you can see the problems before someone falls through. Now I need to tell you about the chemical scandal that changed everything. For decades, the industry used CCA, chromated copper arsenate, 2PA, for pressure-treated wood. It worked. Wood lasted. Then in 2003, the EPA banned CCA for residential use because, surprise, it's incredibly toxic. Arsenic and chromium leaching into your soil, your hands, your kid's playground. So they switched to new treatments. Alkaline, copper quaternary, copper azole. These are less toxic, which is good, but here's what they won't tell you. They're also less effective. The wood doesn't last as long. But by the time you figure that out, the warranty has expired and you're buying more lumber. Even worse, these new treatments are corrosive. They eat through standard fasteners, so now you need special screws and nails that cost three times as much. The lumber industry created a problem, then sold you the solution twice. Want to know something crazy? The pressure treating process itself damages wood. They put lumber in a giant pressure chamber and force chemicals deep into the grain. Sounds good, right? Except this process crushes the wood cells, creates micro fractures, and actually makes the wood more susceptible to moisture penetration once the treatment starts to break down. You're paying extra for wood that's been structurally compromised, but there's hope because some builders are rediscovering these old techniques. I met a guy in Colorado who only builds with reclaimed old growth lumber. He salvages it from buildings being demolished. Some of this wood is over a century old, and it's still superior to anything you can buy new. He air dries any fresh cut timber for 18 months, uses traditional joinery, designs for water management. His structures will outlast anything built conventionally, and they're not even more expensive when you factor in life cycle costs. A deck that lasts 75 years versus one that fails in seven? The old way is actually cheaper. He told me something fascinating. When he tears down old barns, he finds wood that's been exposed to the elements for a hundred years with zero treatment, and it's still perfect. Meanwhile, modern treated lumber in a protected environment fails in under a decade. The difference isn't the treatment, it's the quality of the wood itself. Here's what kills me about all this. We had it figured out. Humanity solved the problem of building durable wooden structures. The knowledge was common. Every carpenter knew it. Then we traded durability for speed and profit, and now we're shocked that nothing lasts. Want to know the real kicker? In Japan, there are wooden temples over a thousand years old. One thousand years. They're still using the original wood. The Horyuji Temple has wood from the year 607. That's 1400 years old, still structurally sound. How? They use the exact same principles Wild West builders used. Old growth timber, proper seasoning, appropriate cuts, design for water management, basic physics and respect for the material. The Japanese have a concept called kigumi, traditional joinery that uses no nails or screws. The wood interlocks, creating structures that flex with earthquakes but don't break. And because there are no metal fasteners, there are no rust points for water to accumulate and cause rot. These buildings breathe, move, and last for millennia. We could be building the same way. The knowledge exists, the techniques are proven, but it's not profitable for lumber companies. So instead, you get a deck that rots in six years and a salesman telling you it's normal. That wood just doesn't last like it used to, which is technically true, but not for the reasons they want you to believe. So what can you actually do about this? First, stop believing the hype about modern treated lumber. It's better than untreated modern lumber, but that's a low bar. If you're building something you want to last, source real wood. Reclaimed old growth if you can find it. Properly seasoned hardwoods, real cedar or redwood, not the junk they sell at big box stores. 
Second, learn to identify quality lumber. Look at the growth rings. Tight rings mean slow growth, mean better wood. Look at the end grain. Quarter sawn shows vertical lines. Flat sawn shows arches. Choose quarter sawn when possible. Weigh the boards. Heavier wood is denser wood, is better wood. Third, demand proper drying. If you can't find air-dried lumber, at least buy keyline dried and let it acclimate in your space for weeks before using it. Let it adjust to local humidity. Check the moisture content with a meter. You want 15% or less for exterior work. Fourth, design like a pioneer. Keep wood off the ground with proper foundations. Create drainage. Allow ventilation. Add drip edges to every horizontal surface. Don't seal wood into moisture traps. Work with physics, not against it. Make overhangs generous. Angle everything to shed water. Fifth, use appropriate fasteners and finishes. Not every project needs a chemical coating. Sometimes a natural oil or nothing at all is better. Wood that can breathe lasts longer than wood that's suffocating under layers of sealer. When when you do seal wood, use products that allow vapor transmission. The wood needs to be able to dry out if it gets wet. Sixth, consider traditional joinery methods where possible. Mortise and tenon, dovetails, lap joints. These create structures that are inherently stronger and allow wood to move naturally with humidity changes. Modern construction relies too heavily on metal fasteners that create rigid connections that stress the wood. Look, I get it. You're not going to hand split lumber and air dry it for three years, but understanding these principles changes how you approach projects. It changes what you buy and how you build. And it means your work might actually last long enough for your grandkids to use. Those Wild West builders weren't working with magic wood. They were working with knowledge. Knowledge that we abandoned in favor of convenience and profit. But that knowledge still works. Physics hasn't changed. Wood biology hasn't changed. What changed is that we stopped respecting the material and started treating it like a disposable commodity. Here's my challenge to you. Next time you're at the lumberyard, Really look at what you're buying. Look at the growth rings. Feel the weight. Think about where it came from and how it was processed. Ask questions. Demand better. Ask about the moisture content. Ask about the drying method. Ask where the trees were harvested. Most lumberyard employees won't know the answers, and that should tell you everything you need to know about modern lumber quality. Because here's the truth that the lumber industry doesn't want you to know. You have the power to change this. Every time you choose quality over convenience, you're voting for a better way. Every time you demand properly seasoned lumber. You're pushing the market toward durability. Every time you use traditional building techniques, you're preserving knowledge that nearly died. And maybe, just maybe, if enough of us start building like those Wild West pioneers, we can create structures that don't just last years, but generations. Buildings that tell a story not of planned obsolescence, but of craftsmanship and respect for materials. Structures that our great-grandchildren will look at and wonder how we built something so permanent in an age of disposable everything. That saloon in Montana, still standing after 140 years. Still solid, still beautiful. That's not luck. That's not magic wood from a forgotten era. That's knowledge. Knowledge we can reclaim if we choose to. Knowledge that's worth more than any pressure treatment chemical. Knowledge that honors the trees that gave their lives to become our homes. The question is, will we?